It just occurred to me how weird it was to probably come around the corner and see this little setup in the middle of a very familiar gallery here at the Biggs, but um, I couldn't help but have this kind of, you know, Mr. Rogers moment here in the galleries with you. Um, so um, this is uh, this is the second official program that we're putting on about the Dali exhibition. And um, in a way, this is becoming the most important one because this is the one that we're gonna be talking about the closure of the museum as well. So uh, the first thing I have to announce to you, sadly, is that the museum's director has made the decision that we are going to close here at the Biggs Museum of American Art for about six weeks. Um, the closure is effective immediately and is going to at least January 30th. Uh, the museum will reassess at that point, um, but uh, we're taking the governor's advisory to stay at home very seriously. Um, and giving you even more reason to stay at home by not drawing you out to come and uh, engage with these, uh, these uh, the prints of Salvador Dali here in this exhibition. Um, that said, we are still going to be presenting programming about Salvador Dali. The first I want to sort of bring to your attention is that we're going to have kind of meditative tours around the exhibition. So these will be accessible on social media platforms as well as through the museum's website in the next couple of days. And you'll be able to quietly and at your own pace sort of just float through the exhibitions or through the exhibition that's here. You'll be able to take and pause on individual images. You'll be able to um, like I said, just kind of meditate. There's none, uh, there's none of me blabbering away. It's just you engaging with the imagery directly. Um, so look forward to that. I definitely engage, uh, encourage you to do it. Um, secondly, we do have additional lectures happening after the holidays, so in January. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the talk tonight um, in a way to help prepare you for what you'll experience in January, but also to sort of differentiate what's different about the things that we're talking about this evening. Um, we still have Dolly Days going on this month. So there are all sorts of different kinds of art activities that you can do with the family and with kids. Um, we are dropping that those art lessons, I believe, every Saturday. And they are, all of the materials that you need are able to be downloaded and uh, in PDF format and printed at home or at, you know, the local Kinko's or something if you need to. Um, if you have any problems with those technical difficulties, get a hold of us. Uh, email one of us. Someone will give them for in information and we'll get back to you. Um, I think that we are about to share one of the contacts for any sort of questions having to do with programming. Kristen, I think, is typing that into the notes section right now. So definitely take note of that particular uh, contact. It'll really help you out in the next six weeks when we're all going to be sitting at home in the dark crying. <laughs> um, so not to fear, Dolly will still be open when we return. The anticipated time to return is the first part of February. Um, if we are on a regular schedule as we are right now, it would technically be February 3rd, but check the website to find out when you'll be able to access the museum again, when you'll be able to see the show, and exactly what the closing date may change to in the coming weeks. So that said, Salvador Dali is still here at the museum, still being shared, still being broadcast, and with the help of God, will be shared again in, um, in person in the next couple of months. In the meantime, stay home, stay safe, have a great holiday. What are we looking at today? Now that I've gone on giving you 20 minutes of commercials. Um, today, we're gonna to be talking about the Divine Comedy. Um, Stairway to Heaven, this exhibition that's here at the Biggs Museum, this is two different sets of prints, two different sets of illustrations representing two different book projects. One from the 1930s, very early in Salvador Dali's career, and then one from the 1950s, about 1960, much later in Dali's career. But both represent kind of high points in, the, in that career. Today, we're actually gonna be talking about the Divine Comedy, the project that he did from about 1951 to 1960. 
And um, we decided to do that because frankly, these are a lot of the images that we're using in our marketing. They're probably the images that you, um, you folks are probably most familiar with, with Dolly. And part of that's by design. These, this was a project that he did to, I think, I'm feeling that he did this in order to attract very large appeal. I feel like this was a project that he did to get a lot of attention internationally and decidedly in America. So he and his wife, Gala, um, they actually left Europe. He is, uh, Salvador Dali was from Spain and um, he and his wife left France just at the outset of World War II and ended up in the United States, stayed for a few years after the war and then eventually ended up back in, I believe that they returned back to Spain. But he and his wife kept a relationship building a patron base in the United States for years afterwards. And so I think that part of what we're seeing here in, um, in the Divine Comedy is a project that would appeal to American sensibilities, which I think is really interesting in terms of overall market. So what is the Divine Comedy? Um, the Divine Comedy is literally, a, it's a poem that was written at around 1300 by Dante Alighieri. 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 I was trying to, um, I was trying to uh, practice that earlier and I was not doing very well at it. And, um, and I know that every Italian on the show tonight is probably about to hang up on me because he is literally the most important poet of the Italian culture. Um, so from about 1300, he lived from 1265 to 1321 um, and 700 years after his birth, the Italian governor or government was planning to celebrate his life, celebrate his existence, his accomplishments um, in Italy with a republishing of the Divine Comedy, one of probably his best known poem, this epic poem uh, made up of 100 cantos. They contracted with Salvador Dali to do the illustrations. He, in this period, in the 1950s, 1960s, was on the cover of Time Life magazine. He was international superstar of the art world. Um, he was sensational. People adored him, um, had a great fan base. And they said, well, this will bring us a lot of attention. Salvador Dali jumped at the opportunity. He was always kind of a self-promoter. He was always kind of a showman. And so uh, what we see happening is that Salvador Dali started to create 100 watercolors. Each watercolor was to accompany one canto of the epic poem of the Divine Comedy. And unfortunately, the Italian government, probably somewhat fueled by the Vatican, um, they had to step away from the deal with Salvador Dali. What would have been probably the most expensive book project ever known in mankind's history had to be scrapped um, with Salvador Dali because of Salvador Dali's earlier life. And he was kind of a known heretic. He, uh, he separated himself from the church many, many years before. He um, was religiously skeptic. He lived in this really, really outrageous, extravagant, lascivious lifestyle um, in his earlier years. And um, he was kind of a bad boy in the art world, if you can imagine it. And so when we are talking about Salvador Dali in the 1950s, he has created this new direction for himself. And part of it was that he was trying to explore his native Catholicism but also just enveloping a new sense of mysticism in his artwork. He was really kind of in a redemptive role in his life and a sort of redemptive period in his life. And at the same time, I think that he, having been shunned by the surrealist artists and writers around him, um, was finding a new area for himself. So using some of his old symbolism, but for new messaging, and the messaging was much more positive, much more introspective, um, uh, or I should say much more um, extroverted. So thinking more about how he connects with the rest of the world as opposed to just what's in his own head. And, um, but the work is also much brighter, much more uplifting. 
and ultimately much more popular. Um, so the book project that fueled the images that we see in this part of the exhibition did not go through, but Salvador Dali contracted with various printers anyways in order to produce them. So he takes his original 101 watercolors and he has them reproduced in woodblock prints or using woodblock print technologies. I think that they were actually not cut exclusively from wood. I think that they were also cut from acrylic, but we'll get into that in just a moment. Um, there were three known sets of these prints. There is a French set, so with the text of the Divine Comedy and the illustrations combined together in French, there are about 4,700 copies of that, um, of that set of 100 prints from the Divine Comedy known to have been produced. There was a subsequent Italian set of over 3,000 copies and a German set, which we have on view here at, in the museum, um, of about a thousand additional copies. So there are at least that we know of at least 9,000 sets, not all of them together, of course, but 9,000 sets of this, of the print project that you see here within the museum floating around within the world. Many of them split up and owned individually, two pieces here, one piece there. Um, What's interesting about this is that because of the technique used to produce this, every image, so every time one of these images is produced is completely unique, or rather unique, I should say. Um, Salvador Dali worked with various printers in order to produce the images that we're seeing in this project. He oversaw the imagery, the translation of that imagery into individual blocks, oversaw the printing process, oversaw the coloration that was being used. The camera is moving upward. And the um, and he basically oversaw the entire process of how these things were produced. But there were always variations. These print, um, each of these prints were created by sometimes five, sometimes as many as 30 individual blocks to create them. Every time you see any little variation of the colors that you see in this, whether it's a dark blue versus a light blue or a red versus a pink or an orange versus a coral, every different color is a different block onto the surface of these prints. And so this really, really, really complicated labor-intensive process for a hundred different images created over 3,500 individually carved blocks in order to produce. This is a very expensive printing process, especially for a project at this scale. But it was always intended to be done in woodblock prints because as each block gets individually inked, by the printer, you're able to create an effect that looks very much like the watercolor that Salvador Dali had originally used. The ink is applied in this very loose, wet manner that creates these very sort of liquid shapes upon, or can create very liquid kinds of shapes upon the surface of the paper. And that's really exciting to watch. That's very um, exciting to, um, processed in order to see firsthand Within the, um, within the exhibition. So when you get a chance, come and see this show. But in the meantime, he produced those watercolors, had the prints produced, and at the same time, he was emphasizing so many of these new kinds of, um, this sort of new direction that he was taking in his own artwork. One that dealt, like I said earlier, around a lot of um, mysticism. Um, he was really interested in this later work uh, between looking at science, looking at scientific terminology, different kinds of scientific phenomenon that happen within the universe, trying to explain the universe in scientific terms, and at the same time, working with Catholic, uh, uh, Catholic and broadly speaking, Abrahamic religious um, symbolism in order to be able to, to, uh, to represent 
images and stories and ideas that people can identify with. And the mysticism that you're seeing in the Divine Comedy really sort of combines these two characteristics in really, really tremendous ways. Now, I'm gonna take a moment here to sort of talk to you a little bit about the upcoming talk that'll happen in January 5th. And this is when I'm gonna be coming back to tell you about the second publishing project that's on view here at the museum. And this is called The Chants de Maldorar, or the, the Songs of Maldorar. Um, and I'll go get into much more detail about what that project was. But like I said earlier, it was a project that had happened in the 30s. It was one that was a very, very different time in Salvador Dali's life. He was not in a redemptive mode in his lifetime and at that point. And the imagery is very, very different. It's much darker, it's much more cynical, it's much more um, uh, personally destructive. Um, and at the same time, very lascivious, very luscious, very um, corporeal sort of experienced, um, looking at what he does to the human body, what he does to the interaction of people, um, the kinds of um, uh, interpersonal sort of relationships that you can see drawn out within these images is very, very different than the ethereal imagery that we see in here. Um, so plan to come back because it's a very different show. The Divine Comedy, for many of you, you might have had to read it in high school. I did not. So I had to actually, I have not read the Divine Comedy entirely, but I've read bits of it to be able to get a gist of what's happening here. And I've read it in English. Um, it is considered one of the great masterpieces of Western literature. Um, it has inspired a lot of different writers, a lot of different filmmakers, a lot of different artists in the world. Um, the symbolism that is created through the moralistic tale of Dante um, is quintessentially very, very important. It's uh, arguably next to the Bible, one of the most important books in Western culture in the last, well, 700 years. So um, the importance and the sort of, uh, even if you haven't read it, you understand a great deal about it because it pops up in popular culture so, so often. Um, I would though, if you get a chance, just uh, skim over some kind of synopsis, some kind of uh, better description about the project before you come to see the work here or before you take um, step into those sort of meditative tours that we're creating within the museum, um, because I think you'll get even more from it. It's just, um, it's, it's, it's fascinating, the imagination that Dante sort of brings up, but essentially Dante in a forest when he's about 30 years old, right around the year 1300. And um, he is, well, he runs into the classical, the Roman poet Virgil. And Virgil says, I can take you on a tour of hell to get you to get your soul ready to be received in heaven. And thus begins this sort of this epic journey where we go through, I think it's what is it, nine, 10 rings of hell and all these sort of ancillary areas that make up these individual rings of hell. Uh, Dante follows Virgil through these sort of trials and tribulations and every circle, every sort of area, every canto of the poem um, and I think there are 33 or I believe 34 cantos dedicated specifically to, um, to the circles of hell, to the inferno, as it's, as it's put. Um, they are, those particular, um, how do I say it? The, every canto is illustrated within this, within, within the show. And every canto is dedicated to a different kind of sinner, a different kind of individual that was um, expressing, in, in that it had it during their lifetime expressed some kind of antisocial behavior. And so we find a canto dedicated, you know, directly to gluttons, another um, canto to hoarders. And when Kristen's able to come back, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the canto that deals with counterfeiters. So in this first print that I'm gonna bring, slide over towards us just a little bit here. 
this is part of the section of the show that deals with the inferno. And um, you, when you come to see, you'll, you'll, the inferno, the section doesn't necessarily deal directly with sort of imagery of the devil, although he's kind of alluded to. Um, and it's not the, the graphic, grueling, um, horrendous artwork, or not horrendous, excuse me, but the sort of like, um, the, the sort of savage imagery that we sometimes associate with Salvador Dali. Um, oftentimes these images are still incredibly uplifting. The color is very colorful, very, very bright. Um, but the work that we're seeing here, it's called um, Men Who Devour Themselves of 1960. And um, in the image, the image is very, very heavily related to a painting that Salvador Dali did called The Persistence of Memory from 1931. And many of you have probably seen that where um, it's the, the classical Salvador Dali painting um, of the Spanish landscape that's dominated by melting clocks. And you sort of see these melting clocks sort of draped over a tree or over a dissecting table that is being used as in this print as a stage. And then also in that persistence of memory, there is a really elongated, abstracted idea of the human, a human face. And it is in that painting devouring, literally sort of beginning to nibble on the edge of another human face. And so here we see one body doing damage to another body, taking over that body, um, controlling that body. And it is meant to sort of symbolize uh, this, this act of devouring, this act of sort of eating up the interests of another person is uh, emblematic of this particular level of hell that we find created for counterfeiters. A lot of the section around Inferno deals really, really heavily with this concept of sin, of course, and it's meant to, um, it's meant to give the readers a really uh, solid grounding and all of those activities in life that can cause you to regret the actions that you take in that life and can place you in places like hell. And so um, this graphic sort of illustration is just one of, well, 34 different in images that sort of deal specifically with that. Now, as Dante and Virgil move forward with their project, I'm just gonna move this one out of the way. This really is very um, Mr. Rogers. I feel like I should have a nice little red cardigan on. I should have changed my shoes. I will show off for a second. I got my first piece of fan, a fan gift. <laughs> um, uh, Mrs. McQueen gave um, the staff here different pens for Christmas because she liked our online programming so much. And so thank you. I hope that you're on today. We all really, really appreciate it. I'm using it tonight. Um, and, um, and I'm just tickled. I love, um, I, I love the idea that people are watching and just appreciate what we're doing. So we are moving on to the purgatory. We're not gonna dwell too heavily into um, the inferno because, um, uh, well, because everybody wants to be uplifted and Dante wanted us to be uplifted because he gave us an entire tour of not only hell, but also purgatory and then eventually heaven. So in this particular image that we see here, this is called The Fallen Angel, also of 1960, also a woodblock print as the whole project is. And you know, you're um, more than welcome to take a look. Um, uh, there is the signature of the artist here. Um, and definitely, just uh, again, I wanna stress the sort of individual sort of care that the artist placed within this. Um, again, Every time the subtle co color variations that you see like through the wings here, the green that you see here, different than the green in the background, different than the darker green that you see here, darker than the very dark green that you see during in the center, each one of those is a different block creating different layers of pig pigment upon the surface of this paper. So we're looking at, a, I mean, through the sort of the subtle variations of the tones and the color that you see on this, in this image, you're seeing a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of um, individual attention from the artists and from the printers. These are really, these are really just masterfully printed pieces. 
So the fallen angel, we, here we are. This is actually the image that starts out the tour of purgatory. And it's interestingly, probably the most reminiscent of Dali's earlier works. Um, many of you I'm sure have seen images of Salvador Dali where he creates within the human body, this idea of sort of open drawers and turns the body into um, kind of an empty piece of case furniture. This really, I'm, I'm a decorative art specialist, um, 18th century guy. And so when I see things of this nature, it really sort of appeals to me because I love how the body is sort of uh, stands in for these furniture forms. And there's like this idea of moving back and forth between these two volumes. Um, usually when Dali were representing these empty drawer configurations, the body sort of opening upward, um, this was meant to sort of represent the human unconscious, the spaces where we hide things, the spaces where we have these sort of backstories that animate us as humans. Um, but in this, he wanted it to represent, it, it becomes sort of a metaphor for um, how we remove sins. So he sort of uses the drawers as a way of depicting spaces where we hide sin. And then when the in purgatory where the drawers are thrust open, they are then emptied and the sin is then removed. And this was really what he was trying to get across when, we, when he describes, when Dante was describing um, purgatory as a place where the soul could be cleansed, perhaps on its way to heaven. Um, just like with the circles of hell, uh, purgatory is layered and there are different places for different peoples. Um, dependent upon the sin of which they need to be cleansed from. And as we move forward through this moralistic tale, the acts that we see in purgatory become lighter and lighter and lighter. So as we get further along through purgatory and ultimately closer and closer to paradise, we see greater attention on these sort of this redemptive sort of space. Um, the redemption that we see illustrated in purgatory then also eventually in paradise, I think really probably appealed to Salvador Dali as he was trying to kind of correct his public image and take on a lifestyle, present himself as an individual who uh, deserved better attention than what he had been getting earlier in his life. So the next thing I wanted to show you was called the opposition. And it is this piece, should I bring it over? I'm going to leave it right here. Let me know if you want to get it a little bit closer or if anything needs to happen. This one is particularly well lit. Um, and this is one of my favorite pieces in the entire show. So here we are again, 1960. And this is actually showing a kind of um, a formal treatment that Salvador Dali did in a number of his paintings of around 1951, 1952. And as you see within these, um, the, the use of these sort of contrasting colors, the blue on the side and the orange on the right. Um, the colors begin to, the, the two forms have broken up into these tiny little particles and they begin to blend. They begin to come together into a new whole. So as you come through, you can see the sort of flecking of orange within the blue and blue within the orange forms. And, this was meant to demonstrate two forces coming together. In this particular canto, um, Dante has, is now with Beatrice and his, his, his muse and his love um, throughout all this life. And St. Thomas Aquinas um, is telling Dante about stories that happened between St. Francis of Assisi, Assisi and St. Dominic. And the two conflicting characters, now we're in paradise now, so the saints are up there, but even there they have philosophical differences. And these philosophical differences begin to be illustrated um, in the ways that they sort of work against each other and the ways that they sort of meld together in the image that you see here. This gets into uh, Salvador Dali's really, his great interest in science. So here he's visualizing he's literally visualizing atomic makeup, molecular makeup of matter, and how all objects within the universe are made up of the same little pieces and how those, there's, it's impossible to tell where one thing stops and the next thing starts because ultimately everything is connected. And 
this was a great way of demonstrating how the two philosophies of St. Thomas of CC or St. Francis of CC and St. Dominic were of the same material, of the same little pieces melding together, not knowing necessarily where one ends and the next starts. And so I've seen a few other paintings where Salvador Dali had used this treatment of breaking up individual figures. Um, you see this with the Raphael-esque head exploding and you also see it with another painting called the Corpuscular of Madonna. Um, and it's very, very effective. It's very interesting. And there's something so dynamic, of course, about the composition. But at the same time, it's just thrilling to think about these individual objects sort of exploding out and then blending into a new whole. Um, and it's just such a, it's, it's, it's such an interesting way to sort of think about how these ideas overlap. Um, so great fan, great fan, good job. And the last print that I was gonna show you tonight is called The Ghost of Christ. And this is probably of the artworks that we're gonna see tonight or you see in the show, the one that is probably most definitively Catholic um, or I should say most definitively Christian. And um, many of you will have seen this in Salvador Dali's um, The Crucifixion of St. John on the Cross of 1951, a painting that he did with a very, very similar sort of foreshortened view down the back of a crucified Christ. And um, Salvador Dali himself was really inspired by a drawing that he had seen that had been produced in the 17th century in order to be able to produce those paintings, which then sort of influenced this piece. And even though Christ was not necessarily um, mentioned in this particular canto of the Divine Comedy, it was uh, a way to sort of represent, which was the, the subject of the canto, which was the formation of the cross through two rays of light. And so what I think is kind of interesting here, and I don't want to be too, um, uh, I don't want to be too cynical about, um, about Salvador Dali. You know, he lived in such a, um, such a fantastic and such an over the top manner through most of his life in order to be able to generate art sales, really to be able to gain people's attention, to have them think two and three times about his ideas and his artwork. And I have to wonder that even though he takes this more tame and more traveled road of representing Catholic iconography within his artwork, I have to wonder if he's still very much interested in this idea of generating pet patronage for himself, finding greater and greater audiences for his artwork um, and ultimately, receive, you know, continuing to receive the kind of attention that he had always craved, um, not only within his lifestyle, but within his, sort of, his own artistic practice. Um, I think that there is probably much better scholarship than what I have ever produced on, um, on this particular topic out there, which is why um, we have invited to the museum um, the, the actual curator of this, this, this exhibition, the individual who put this show together, who did the majority of the label and signage text that you see within the museum. Um, I mean, I've added some things here when I wanted to be able to explain a little bit more about Salvador Dali's biography and about some of his background, but the real sort of analysis, the deep analysis of some of these images can come from a guy named David Rubin. And he is going to be here at the museum on January 19th. Um, or excuse me, he's not gonna be at the museum. He's gonna be speaking through another Zoom call to the museum. Um, but we've hired him basically to come and do an analysis of a number of, um, uh, of a, a great amount of Salvador Dali's imagery about his, about his symbolism, about the iconography that you see in both of these art projects. And I think that's gonna be fascinating. Um, there are individuals out there that Salvador Dali is such a complex artist. He has sort of created this whole cosmology of symbols that unless you have um, had the chance to study this really, really extensively, um, it's just gonna be really difficult to be able to do it justice. 
Um, so I can give you this little introduction. I will give you another little introduction on January 5th to the other half of the exhibition. But I would really recommend that you come back for David Rubin's talk because I think it's gonna be super, super smart. Um, so given that, do we have any questions? This is the time to again, go back to your note section and type in some questions for uh, Christian, Christian to translate to me. And um, and let's let's get on with this. <laughs> Hi, Ryan. We have a question about some of the symbols being used mm -hmm. in these pieces. Do you have a specific artwork that you could reference that really talks about uh, the symbolism that Dolly is using um, in order to illustrate one of these cantos? Um. Similarly to how you talked about his molecular makeup happening. I mean, sometimes he references individual subjects in the cantos really specifically. Um, so there are examples of um, levels of hell for the centaurs or individuals um, within the within hell that um, are passing judgment over those individuals who pass through hell. Um, different kinds of classical figures. There's a figure of Atlas that's mentioned and the weight of the world on his shoulders. There's even imagery that sort of um, uh, has kind of uh, almost sort of pictorial um, or even sort of like decorative characteristics that it just really sort of demonstrates the path that Dali is taking along the way. Um, but um, so sometimes he gets into a little bit, a little bit more of his own personal symbolism like what we saw with um the with the first image that i demonstrated with the um the, the people who meet each other and then in other cases there are um uh, more literal translations of what's happening actually with the molecular imagery where you have the two subjects coming together and sort of melding their ideas into one we have a question um are there any prints that reference his relationship with Paolo and Francesca? I don't remember them being referenced, no. If that person um, would, um, if they're able to sort of, elub, um, sort of elaborate on Paolo and Francesca, if they are characters within the Divine Comedy that I just were, wasn't aware of, or if they are people, um, I, you know, Salvador Dali, he doesn't do it so quite so much, a little bit in the divine in his images for the Divine Comedy, but in the songs of Maldorar, he references his relationship to his wife and muse Gala quite a bit. And so she and her um, portrait actually shows up several times within that project. So he does actually reference people within his own life within the artworks that he creates. Although with the Divine Comedy, he is a little bit more illustrative. He's thinking more as an illustrator in this than he is perhaps in some of his other projects. There is this point that I want to bring out though. Um, one of the things that I think is really great about this show is that Salvador Dali was known to have created about 1500 prints, 1500 prints in his career. And this show demonstrate or displays 150 of them. So literally 10% of his graphic output in his life, most of them for book projects are featured in this show. Um, so we do have a clarification on who those two people were. Awesome. Uh, the clarification is that they were sort of the adulterous relationship that he had early on in his career. Oh, um, I, I think that there were several individuals that fall under that. And, um, you know, his, um, uh, there's a lot of discussion about Salvador's sexual history. Um, or and in some people in some interpretations, non-sexual history. Um, so that is actually a subject that's probably covered much better in the sounds of Maldoror. We'll have to, um, we won't get X-rated in that discussion, but we might get a little bit PG-13 in that discussion that'll happen on January 5th, um, because it's really difficult to not talk about Salvador Dali sexuality and his relationships to the art world, to some of his patrons, to his wife, certainly, um, and to the public generally. Um, it's hard to understand his particular sets of symbols that he created in sur surrealism without necessarily knowing some of the demons that he was confronting and sexuality was definitely one of them. 
um, I would love to have a great discussion with that. So please come back on January 5th because I think it'll be, um, it'll be fun. Um, we have another question. Um, can you elaborate on how Dolly may have helped popularize any psychological theories? Well, I believe, if I remember correctly, he was very interested in Freud. He was very interested in the subconscious. He seemed very interested in those things that frightened people. Um, this will also come out more when we talk uh, about the science of Maldoror and we talk about his paranoid critical method, um, which is, uh, it was basically like a trans-like state that he would set himself into in order to be able to come up with the symbols that populated so much of his surrealist imagery in the first half of his career. Um, and was still very influential later in his life when he did work in the 1930s, 1960s and further. But um, he was driven by the self-conscious. He was driven by where, what could be created from self, the self-conscious and by those, um, those subjects that caused panic, that caused revulsion, that caused strong emotional responses and the imagery that he was able to create meditating upon those, um, those impulses. Um, it's, um, it's really, really interesting stuff. <laughs> he's a little bit of a nut and I really dig him. But um, yeah, Freud, he's really interested in Freud. Can you elaborate or identify any images or illustrations that sort of show how the speaker is talking about Dolly's path? Um, yeah, I mean, so please go ahead and bring it over. <laughs> We're just gonna pop it right off the wall. Um, this is actually the first image in the entire show. And one of the things, um, and it sort of, it introduces Dante. First off, it puts you on the path in hell. Well, actually it places you on the plains of Spain where he, um, where Salvador Dali was originally from. So it sort of references his own background as well, but it identifies Dante in the red robe. It puts him into the landscape. It describes him in the path. And then oftentimes as we're going through the hundred images as you're sort of following the hundred cantos, sometimes the illustration that Dali decides to, to create um, are directly referencing Dante himself. Sometimes it's Dante and Virgil together. Beatrice is often represented within this, uh, within this narrative. And those characters that are following the path are often subjected to the, the trials or the, 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 the characters that you find on the path itself. So they, they're often pictured interacting with the sinners, interacting with the angels, um, kind of partaking of these, um, these sort of mystical moments along the, along the path. So there is a very strong kind of narrative connection with these images. I hope that answered your question. Brian, we have a question that has come up. Um, as you've gone through hanging this uh, collection of artwork, do you have any particular piece that really stands out to you that you think um, could possibly be your favorite? Oh, I did mention that um, I thought that the, um, the sort of molecular, the, the sort of molecular technique that he was using um, was a particularly strong one. There are a couple of images that are, I think, um, so just a little bit of background for me. One of my first jobs in a museum was actually working for a curator of prints and works on paper. And so there are a couple of images here that are uh, so sophisticated, are such a pleasure to look at artistically that they have such gorgeous use of color um, and the shapes and the sort of this technique, this really, really interesting technique of trying to represent the wash of watercolor in a woodblock medium. Um, sometimes those come together in such an elegant way that I just kind of, I just sort of, there's a few that I just got stopped in my tracks. Um, there, there are definitely, uh, there are definitely a couple that I am drawn to because of that technique. There are also a couple here that I'm just really, really interested in the, um, the, the image that's created. Uh, 
uh, <laughs> I'm attracted to a few of the skulls, representation of the sort of elongated skulls. Um, there are a couple of uh, figural studies that I think are particularly um, evocative and just super, super fun. Um, No, it's, it's hard to say. There's over a hundred images just in this part of the exhibition. So um, it's almost as if my, my, my favorite changes on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the things that I think is really fun about this show is that um, not only is Dolly referencing his own artwork in some of the works, but he's also referencing other artists' works as well. He seemed to be extremely knowledgeable about the history of Western art and was, uh, was, not, was not hesitant or did not hesitate to sort of riff off of other people's concepts and incorporate those ideas. So you see Michelangelo in his work, you see um, medieval uh, British painting and uh, techniques and portraiture, you see uh, sort of Dutch concepts coming up in his artwork. It's really, it's, it's, it's very interesting how much he kind of absorbs from other individuals. We, I think we have time for one more question, if there's one more out there. So for those of you, um, while we're waiting to see if one more question, for those of you that are interested in doing a little bit of study about this, about the show and about the um, illustration projects that are represented here, as well as the images that um, Dolly did for the Bible itself. Um, we do have this publication for sale. It's really inexpensive. I think it's like $40 or something like that, but it's enormous, beautifully illustrated. And I think it's available online. So, um, and you can always sort of, order it and have somebody sort of drop it off to you or have, you know, be available to sort of come and pick it up here at the museum while we're closed. Or we can mail it or whatever the case may be. But um, it's a terrific, terrific project, a terrific uh, publication and um, just a beautiful sort of representation of the show. All right, Ryan, we have our last question of the evening. Uh, can you talk about any uh, visual connections running throughout this, um, this side of the collection, the Divine Comedy? Any visual threads that kind of connect it together? Well, Dolly, I think is always, and this is probably true of both sides of the show, um, Dolly is always really, really interested in the narratives that are created through the, through the body. And like, so the human form is really sort of heavily represented throughout the entirety of the show. It, but it's interesting how, widely and in such different ways he treats the body in order to twist and to contort that storyline. Um, so, you know, these abstractions, these stylizations that he places upon the body really sort of change the mood, change the narrative, change that storyline really, really heavily throughout the, throughout the, um, throughout your sort of passage through the multiple contests of the Divine Comedy. Um, but yeah, I think it's the body. I think it's really the way that he represents um, humankind and the sort of, I don't know, the different sides of people that he brings out basically in this art, uh, in this artwork. Um, sometimes transcendent, sometimes incredibly flawed, um, sometimes broken, uh, sometimes cruel, but, um, but always human. Well, I'm going to be mindful of time. I don't want to draw people on for too, too long, um, but Thank you for your patience and waiting to be able to come and see this show. If you haven't seen it, do look for us on the website. Um, we will be enthusiastically keeping the doors wide open to you shortly. Um, and until then, join us again on January 5th, January 19th. Take a look at the website for all the kids activities that are happening and definitely download some of those meditative tours of the show because I think you'll get a really, really solid view of the exhibition. And like I said, you can take it at your own pace. You can spend all day here if you want. Um, so I think that is everything from me and I will see you after the winter break. Bye.